Welcome to this advanced shell scripting video titled How to Create Shell Scripts That Are Executable in Multiple Shells. This video describes how to write your shell script code in such a way that it is executable by a variety of shell interpreters, specifically Corn Shell, Bash, or Z Shell. In this video, I'll use a shell script function named GetFileStruct as an example and a guide to illustrate how to write shell code in this way. Now the purpose of the shell script function that I will use as the example is uh, to traverse a directory tree. Here's what it does right here. Traverses a directory tree and as it traverses the tree it identifies all the files and directories in the tree and then creates arrays of values that correspond to the owner, group, and permissions of each file or directory in the tree. Alternatively, it can also produce the Unix or Linux commands to reset the values for the owner group and permissions of each file or directory in the tree. So the first thing you want to do is to download the get file struct shell script so that you can use it as a guide or reference. And to do that, you'll want to open a browser and go to mountzia.com. That's mtxia.com. And once you get there, go to download and click on scripts. And on that page, go to corn. And in that page, you'll want to scroll all the way to the bottom. And you'll see a, a file called get struct, uh, get file struct. And on that, you'll see three links here at the bottom. There's a corn shell 93 version, a bash version, and a multi-shell version. You want to click on the multi-shell version. And you can uh, select everything on that page. Just select it all, cut it, and then paste it to a file on your local system. And that will give you a copy of this multi-shell version of the get struct file, uh, get struct, get file struct shell script. Uh, now, one thing I also wanted to mention that is on this page, the same page with the link to the get file struct shell script, if you scroll up in that page, there is a shell script template here as well. So this is a template for writing shell scripts. And there's a corn shell 93 version of that. There's also a multi-shell version of that template. You may want to download that multi-shell version of this template because you can use that to write multi-shell versions of your own script. So that template file is out there as well. But for the purpose of this video, I am going to use the get file struct shell script, the multi-version, uh, the multi-shell version of that shell script to uh, illustrate uh, our discussions in this video. And then writing multi-shell versions of scripts between corn shell, bash, and z shell is relatively easily easy because these shells are fairly similar. There's only a few differences that need to be addressed and one of the differences is that the bash shell uses the echo command while corn uses the print command. Now the corn shell print command automatically interprets escape sequences. I'm going to scroll all the way to the bottom here. Uh, the corn shell print command automatically interprets the escape sequences such as a backslash n for a new line or a, a backslash t for a tab character and there's several other escape sequences that the tab, the uh, print character, or the print command in corn shell interprets. The bash echo command does not interpret those escape sequences by default. In order to get the bash echo command to interpret the escape sequences, you have to include the minus E option. So in order to make the shell script code portable between corn shell and bash, Whenever the script is running in bash mode, it should use the echo minus E command just in case there are escape sequences embedded within strings that are being printed to the screen. So that will ensure, if you use minus E option with the echo command, that will ensure that any embedded escape sequences are always interpreted correctly by the shell. 
Now then, if you look at this example code, let's scroll back up to the top, you'll see a, a variable here called cmd underscore echo. Command echo is what I'm calling that. And the command echo variable contains the either the echo command for bash or the print command for corn shell. So let's see where that's defined. So here's the main body of the script. Everything above this point is functions. So here's where the main body of the script begins. And we can see here we're defining a variable called GBL echo, and I'm calling that global echo. And so GBL echo by default is set to an echo minus E command. And then we're also doing some checking here for a variable called SH code. So let's let's see how we get the the value of that SH code variable before we talk about the global echo variable. This SH code variable is what we're using to determine the type of shell code uh, or the type of shell interpreter that we're using. And so the way we get to that is we read the shebang line from our current script. Now the shebang line is the first line of the file that begins with a hash bang character. So let's go back to the top of the file and look at that. In this instance we have the user bin kshell93 specified as the script interpreter because it is the shebang line. It is the first line of the file and it begins with a hash bang character. So if it's the first line of the file starts with a hash bang character that's called the shebang line. So what we're doing here is we're reading the shebang line, the first line of the file, from our current file, our current shell script file, and we're reading that value into that variable. And then we are using that variable and testing it to determine if it has, if it's a K shell interpreter, a corn shell interpreter, and if so, we're setting a variable called sh code to the value of corn. If that shebang line is a bash interpreter, we're setting the shell code variable to bash. And if the shebang line is a Z shell interpreter, we're setting the shell code variable to Z shell. So now that we have a variable, SH code, that tells us what type of shell interpreter we, we're using, we can now use that variable to set variable commands and execute specific sections of code and determine which code needs to be executed for which shell interpreter. So as we talked about earlier, there are differences between corn shell and bash, and one of them is the use of the echo and print command. So what we do here is we set a variable called global echo equal to echo minus E, the minus E for the escape sequences, and then we test the shell code variable to see if it's equal to corn, and if it is, then we change the value of global echo to the corn shell print command. And then we test it again to see if it's equal to Z shell. And if it is equal to Z shell, we change the global echo command to the corn shell print command and tell Z shell to emulate corn shell. Z shell has the ability to do corn shell emulation. So instead of having three different types of shell code in this one script, we just tell the Z shell to emulate corn shell. That way we only have to code for corn shell or bash. And then finally we test shell code for bash. And if it's a ba if the bash interpreter has been specified, then we also execute a shell opt, an sh opt command under bash and tell it to turn on extended globbing. And what that does is it tells Bash to also do, to enable the interpretation of various uh, variable operators and variable substitution capabilities that are similar to the way Corn Shell operates. So we're turning on capabilities in Bash 
that are similar to corn chip. So we can use all those functions and variable substitution capabilities that corn shell has in our bash script. Now another difference between corn shell and bash is the typeset and declare commands. They perform the same types of function as functions in each shell but have different command names and some of the command line options are different as well. So in some later versions of uh, bash, the typeset command is a synonym to the declare command. So no special coding is required to detect or fix this difference in later versions of bash. But some of the options between the typeset command and the declare command, typeset being corn shell, declare being bash, there are some differences in the options that are used with those commands. So the best way to code this is to test for the shell script code type, and if it's corn shell, then execute your typeset commands, and if bash, execute the declare commands. And we have a section in here that does just that. So at the top of this function, the get file struct function, we test the shell code variable, and if it's corn shell or Z shell, we use the typeset command to define some variables. And the reason we're defining variables in this function is because it, when we use the typeset command with a variable, it makes that variable local to the function. So we want those these variables to be local variables to this function. So we're using the, the typeset command. Now if the, the interpreter the shell code interpreter is bash, then we, we're using the declare command to do the same sort of thing with these variables. And then we also have a section, if it's not corn shell here, or z shell, and if it's not bash, then we just set the values of some variables in this section of code. So the first section is for corn shell and z shell using the types command typeset command. The second section of this if statement tests for bash, and if it's bash, it does a declare. And the third section, if it's not any of those, then it just sets the values of, very, of a normal shell variable. Now again, the reason why we separated the typeset definitions from the declare definitions is because some of the command line options are different between these two commands. So you may need to separate those to, um, to separate the differences in your command line options to those commands. Now in this particular example, there were no command options used. We were simply using the typeset and declare commands to make variables local to the function. Um, but uh, we could have probably just collapsed uh, this whole section of logic here with these, these if statements into, um, into a single group using the typeset command. But uh, the point here was to illustrate the logic of separating the commands. But uh, remember that, remember earlier I mentioned that in later versions of bash the typeset and declare commands are synonyms, so we could have, as I said, just collapsed this whole if statement logic into always using the typeset command. There's really no need to separate the declare and typeset commands in later versions of bash unless you're using something specific with the declare option that has different command line options than is recognized with the typeset command. So depending upon what you're attempting to do with your script, it may require some additional separation of command logic, but uh, you can use this script, this get file struct script, as an example and guide on how to do some of that. So now then, let's run the script. Let's go ahead and run this script. And what we'll do is we'll uh, uh, run this script and then we'll change it each time we run it to run it as a under a different script interpreter. So first of all, let's run this script. Let me let me put the bash um, shebang line at the top. So let's look at that and I'll go in here and put the bash shebang line at the top of the file. And then I will 
run that script with the question mark option so that we can see what all the options are. And the way we're going to run this is we're going to run it in verbose mode. We'll tell it this verbose mode. And we'll tell it to generate commands to create directory structures. And we'll also use the minus s option to create symbolic links. So let's run that command. Do a minus v for for verbose, minus C, minus S, and we'll run this, we'll tell it to start in a top level directory of doc slash corn show. I remember the purpose of this script is to traverse a directory tree and give us a list of files and directories under that tree and generate a command uh, to reset the owner group and permissions on the files and directories under that tree. So the output of this script is going to be another script, basically. And it's just going to be a script that resets owners, groups, and permissions on files and directories. Now I'm going to output that. Let's go ahead and run it so you can see what that looks like. And so you see it generates a bunch of information here on a bunch of different files. You can see all these files and it's doing things like a change own, change group, chmod on files. So let's go ahead and run that script again and let's output, send the output to temp bash.out. Remember we put the bash shebang line at the top of this file. So we're going to send the output to a file called temp bash.out. Now, we'll look at the output of that, of that script a little closer in a moment, but first let's run it again, and this time let's run it as a corn shell script. So we'll edit the file, we'll move the corn shell script shebang line to the top of the file, write it, and so now then this time We'll run that exact same command line again. We'll run that script again. And except this time we'll output the we'll send the output to a file called tentksh.out. Because remember we're running it this time as a corn shell. And then finally let's edit that script again. And this time let's run it as Z shell. So we've got the Z shell shebang line at the top. And this time, let's send the output to Z shell dot out. So exact same uh, command line running the script, the same script again, except this time we're sending the output to temp Z shell dot out. So now we see that we've got three output files, temp bash dot out, temp ksh.out and temp zshell.out.